All right, good morning. How is everyone? Morning. How is everybody doing? Morning, Mr. Anthony. How about yourself? I'm doing yeah. well, Winsley. Thank you for being here. Thank you uh, for everyone who's being here. I'm going to be admitting people all along just like uh, normal. So if I look a bit distracted, it's because I'm admitting people from the waiting room. But um, hopefully you have a lot of ideas, a lot of things that are on your mind that you want to discuss this morning. As we admit more people and, and, and our, our group starts to grow, I want to take a selfish moment or two to share just how good God has been to my family this week. I won't give you all the details right right now, but my mother, who many of you know and, and love, has got diagnosed with COVID-19 on Tuesday. And to say that I was worried and afraid is a huge understatement. We prayed, a lot of you prayed, and bottom line, that same Tuesday around noon, about three hours after I learned that she had COVID-19, she was released from the hospital and she's been doing better ever since. So just wanna praise God, just brag on God and tell you once again, God is good. Now God is good regardless of what came, came of that situation and what will come of that situation later on. God is always good. But to have that answer to prayer so quickly, it, it had my, head spinning because God is so good and he acted so fast. Um, we're just, we're just praising God. So I wanted to start out this morning with that bit of encouragement and just let you know that always keep praying, draw near to God, no matter what's going on, because he is the only source of um, healing and comfort. So that's what's going on with me. And uh, the floor, I think, is open. I want to double check with Dee. I don't know if she is, is logged on just yet, but we've been talking about sexual morality. We've been talking about homosexuality. And I want to make sure that Dee's original question has been answered. So let's kind of, can, can anyone tell me if Dee is, is on yet? Is Dee on Facebook? Okay, so she, she may not be on just yet, but we're going to start addressing some new topics this morning. And if D is not, um, if the question is not complete, if it hasn't been completely answered according to D, we will go back and we will address some of the uh, topics regarding homosexuality and uh, sexual immorality. Does that sound good so far? Yep. Yes, sir. All right. So with that, we're gonna move forward. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. All right, excellent. Thank you for that feedback. We got some uh, new equipment here that we're trying out. So hopefully that'll work better. Hopefully you'll be able to hear uh, my lovely wife and my lovely daughter even better also. Uh, so with that, the floor is open. And I think a couple of you guys had some, some things you wanted to bring up from last week. So if you will, please remind me of what those were and we will jump into the Bible and get started. This is kind of tagging in from last week, but it's not like directly about it. Because I know like we mentioned, my family mentioned how you do have some people who are now convinced that, oh, homosexuality is okay because somehow society's view on it is affect, affects the Bible. And how if someone won't change their view on that, they're doing false teachings. And what do we, as, and if they're in the church, what do we as Christians do with those people in the church? Because dismemberment in the church is not something we like to talk about, but there is problems with it. And I know in Romans, Paul talks about it with the case of the woman and her son getting married and how that was not okay and how the church in Rome was still letting them come into the church, even though they weren't repenting and changing from that. All right, so I think I understand a bit of what you're saying, Gina, and this is a, a good thing to pick up on because I think we did start getting into this last week. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a hard time just as a, as a brother in Christ. We don't like to talk about disfellowship much, 
but let's be clear that we we have not done any dismembering in the body of Christ for a very, very long time. If you will allow me to give you a little bit of a hard time this morning. Oh, no, I understand that. But I also know looking at the world where we are today and how people want to basically say, oh, we want the Bible to say what it sh what we wanted to say rather than what the Bible does say. And people have been doing that for years. You are having Absolutely. Where people come in and are trying to preach false teachings. And how are you supposed to respond to that? OK, so we got the topic of false teaching and essentially wanting to accept that which God does not accept. So we got a couple of things going on. Now, Gina, you mentioned a verse in Romans and I see a verse in First Corinthians. And I don't know if we're talking about the same thing or not. So I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, where it talks about, Paul writes, he says, it's actually reported that there is a sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. That's what it is, is that... sorry. We okay, went no back problem. and forth between them. <laughs> Absolutely. There, there's a lot of um, similarities, especially in these in these books, these letters that were written, written by Paul, because there was a lot of stuff that was very similar. So let's kind of jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 5 as we get into this, and we're going to talk about some false teaching here in a little bit and what we're supposed to do about false teaching. So I'm going to invite everyone to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll pick it up in verse 1. Now, before we even get to verse 1, I don't know how many of you have a, um, a, a, an NIV translation or how many of you have a translation that has subheadings in it. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there is a subheading before you even get to verse 1. If you have that in your Bible, will someone be so kind as to share what that subheading says? Dealing with a case of incest. Okay, yours says dealing with the case of incest. Anybody else have a different one? Anastasia. Expel the immoral brother. Okay, yours says expel the immoral brother. Can you guys hear Anastasia all right this morning? Yes, that was clear. Excellent, okay, so good. All of our equipment seems to be working just fine this morning, so you can hear all of her good comments. Mine also says, expel the immoral brother. Now, these subheadings were obviously not in what Paul wrote to the churches. This has been added for reference purposes. This is not the, the, uh, the words of God here in these subheadings. However, they do give you a clue as to what's coming next. So as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, we've already read. Verse 2 I'm sorry, let's read it again, because I know a couple of you guys just joined and you may be wondering what in the world we're talking about. So for those of you who are just joining, we're talking about those who have gone from one extreme to the other. And that extreme is overreacting and acting as though my particular form of sin is less offensive than someone else's form of sin, specifically regarding sexual morality. There's been people who have said, you know what, homosexuality is so so much worse than regular old heterosexual lust, heterosexual immorality. It's not. And here's one of the things that Gina has brought up that we're going to talk about. First Corinthians chapter five, verse one, again, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife and you are proud Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? So this is appalling to the Apostle Paul. As he's hearing this and he's writing, he's going, you guys are doing things that are worse than people who don't even wear the name of Christ. And unfortunately, we see this type of, um, this type of sinful behavior among God's people, even in the Old Testament. We see them start to adopt practices in the Old Testament that the people who lived in Canaan before didn't even do. So we see people who wear the name of God, 
people who belong to the body of believers sinning in ways that pagans are going, dude, we, we don't even do that. What are you guys doing? This is, this is just not right. Paul says, shouldn't you have rather been filled with grief when you see someone who is caught in a sin, it should fill your heart with grief. This is not something to be accepted or embraced. This is something that should break your heart. Why? Why should this break your heart? Because it separates them from God. You're absolutely right, Gina. It separates them from God and it breaks God's heart. So Paul continues, he says, you should have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this. There is a time when a believer has to hold another believer to the standards that Christ has outlined. And this is well past that time where the body of believers represent Christ. And Paul's saying, you, you shouldn't even tolerate this in your assembly. This is not acceptable behavior. And this is not something that's just so weird, like, oh, you Christians are so judgmental. How dare you put someone out? Every organization almost that you know has standards. And when people don't live up to those standards, they can't be a part of that organization. That's, that's just how that works. So Paul says, you should have expelled the, these immoral brothers. You should have put them out of your assembly. Uh, I want to jump down and let's, let's look at some of the why, because why this is necessary is very important. Uh, verse three says, even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit and I've already passed judgment on the one who did this. Pass judgment? What do you mean, Paul? Let's keep going. He says, I've passed judgment just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Paul is addressing something that is very painful, very difficult for us to do as Christians. He says there needs to be church discipline. And that is to disfellowship someone who chooses to live a sinful life and they are unrepentant. There is a purpose for doing this. The purpose is so that if you want to go and do what Satan has said to do, then go do what Satan has said to do. There is something that should happen as a result of that. The sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. This brother is in danger, in danger of not being included in the body of believers in heaven. So Paul says, this is what you do here and now. It is not going to be pleasant, but the idea is redemption forever. Give me some thoughts on that because that is big. That is a heavy, heavy topic to discuss. Let's, let's get your thoughts before we go any further. I think it's important to know that because people like to cling to other people, even if they're doing something that's wrong, because they don't want to sacrifice the relationship they have with that person. And it comes down to what do you value more, your relationship with that person or their hopeful eternal life instead of damnation. Well said. Give me some more thoughts. I think I'm um, thinking about it. Um, you know, there's times I forget where the other verse is, but um, you know, there's scriptures that talk about being in a space to try to bring someone to Christ, to you know, to not give up in a way. Um, you know, I I think it may be there's another verse related, but I'm I'm referring. I think I'm referring to the verse that says, "If a brother sins against you, um, seven times, then you forgive him seventy seven times seventy seven. Um, I was just thinking about how at some you know at some point where 
um, for some people, you can help them as much as you can. And then, um, but then God doesn't say like, say like you're trying to bring someone to a church or you're trying to bring someone to Christ. Um, God doesn't say just don't give up because he says, you know, try the best. And but after a certain point, there's really nothing you can really do. Um, then other than, you know, continue doing what you got to do to make sure your salvation is secure. And so I think it's really interesting thing how um, God realizes that, like, even with people, um, there comes a point where we can, it's like being a dead horse and we just have to let him do his work. And I just, you know, pray that, you know, whoever we're doing with, you know, comes back. And um, because you may be scared, you may have a, a family member that, um, you know, you want to get into heaven, but, you know, all our, our salvation is, you know, personal is not tied to any family member or anything like that well said Winsley you speak to a very difficult um, situation Anthony this is something that's running through almost every single church and and even in the even in the the life that we live because quite frequently nobody wants to hold anybody accountable for anything it is very difficult for somebody to sit back and say that, you know, you want to become a Christian and, and there's nothing required of you to become a Christian. And quite frequently we allow people to come in and do things and say things and, and nobody says anything. This is one of the reasons why people get frustrated with the body and, and walk out and leave because we can't, you know, there, there is no discipline. There is no requirements. There, there appears to be nothing that's, solid that holds people accountable for anything you know some some religions they require you to memorize the entire bible from front to back and be able to recite it and stuff but time and time again we we don't seem to ask anything of people e even to even to donate your time your efforts your 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 something some gift that you have to be able to give back to the family of god so i mean and, and even in even in our personal lives when I can still remember when, when I was had my career as a police officer, how people would come to work and we know people that we work with don't deserve to wear a uniform, much less carry a gun. But the people that are above us that we work for don't seem to care. So, I mean, it's a constant struggle that we go through each and every day of our lives to try to do what's right and be recognized for doing what's right. But this, this is one of the difficult things that happens, you know, when we go through these types of situations. But I couldn't remember the last time when, when we had a church, when the church disciplined somebody, much less talked about it. But we have to keep praying and stick to the word, because if you stick to God's word, you're going to be OK. And, and that's what that's what's tough to do in, in a situation like these. You know, you have to be the one person that's standing up. For what's right and and time and time again you know some of us are fighting and fighting and and saying no no this is wrong and we have the bible to back us up so we have to stand on god's word even when you're standing alone and this is exactly what it talks about because when you believe in god's word and you trust in god's word and you have faith in his word that he's not going to fail you sometimes you're left the only person standing and you have to be there standing. And God said he'll never leave you and never forsake you. Amen to that. What you say is 100% accurate. And let's continue reading a bit because Paul gives some reasons as to why. And let's use his language to delve into this a bit more. He's about to give us an example from the Old Testament. And we're going to read through that. If we need to clarify some things, we will. But let's pick it up in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. 
Now, if we lost you on that, it's because you may not be as familiar with some of the practices of the Jewish people in the Old Testament. When they observed the Passover, they were supposed to do so with bread without yeast. So to have yeast in this particular case was a bad thing. You may be going, dude, what, what do you got against yeast? It makes my bread nice and fluffy, and I, and I like that stuff. This is an analogy that Paul is using. So he says, no old yeast. And he's comparing that to the sin that this man and other people may be involved in. Because yeast, once it gets into a batch of dough, you can't get it out. It doesn't come back out. It works through the whole batch and it changes it fundamentally. When sin is in a church, you must get rid of that batch of dough and get some new dough that doesn't have the yeast. So he's saying you must remove from your fellowship because this will spread. Look at verse nine. I've written you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Wait a minute. Don't associate with sexually immoral people. Paul immediately gives you more clarification. He says, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. Paul is drawing a clear line. Look, we expect non-Christians to act like non-Christians. And that's, a, that's the thing we can talk about at length as well. But non-Christians aren't supposed to act like Christians. Like the pagan is supposed to do pagan things. If it's not about Jesus, why wouldn't you? So he said, I'm not talking about people of the world because yeah, literally you wouldn't be able to act, interact. You would have to leave the world. He says, but now I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, meaning a Christian that also extends to a sister in Christ. This is not exclusive to males. But if anyone calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler, with such a man do not even eat. Now, personally, I've had to put this into practice. I knew some people who were caught up in some sins that refused to repent, that this was a choice they made. And I had to make a choice because the Bible says, don't even eat with them. Now, do I interact with them? Yes, in an effort to try and bring them back to Christ. Every time, it's in an effort to try and bring them back to Christ. But, hey man, let's sit down, and let's, let's talk about old times, you know, it's all good. No, it's not. And what Paul is talking about is you need to make a distinction between the people who obey God and the people who don't, because God definitely makes a distinction. So he says, this is how you're supposed to deal with it. There's supposed to be church discipline. And the idea is for you and other believers to say, you are not behaving in a way that is in keeping with the blood of Christ. Therefore, we do not consider you a part of our fellowship. And the idea is to help wake them up. Wait a minute, what do you mean you don't consider me a Christian? What do you mean you don't consider me uh, a believer? No, we don't. And that should make a difference. When you accept someone who is doing wrong, you deceive them. You help deceive them into thinking that their actions are okay. If you accept it, then, must, then God must accept it as well. But he doesn't, and neither should you. So Paul then says in verse 12, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? And that's a good question for you to ask yourself. What business is it of yours to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? Paul asked it as a rhetorical question. And the answer is yes, you are. You are supposed to hold Christians to the standards that you read in this Bible. It's only right. God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. This is how you're supposed to behave. Now, I've said it, my brother Daryl said it, many of you have said it, you're not seeing it in many churches. Is it because you don't have people who are immoral? No, that's not why. This is uncomfortable and we don't like to do it. And when we don't do what God said, how you expect that to work? 
That's why things don't happen. Um, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it tells you that, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, or old things, excuse me, are passed away. Behold, all things become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us to the ministry of reconciliation. We're, we're not, you know, one of the things that that happens, Anthony, is that when, when we give our lives to Christ, that's exactly what it means, our lives to Christ. We don't, you know, say on Sunday only or Wednesday night or when I'm driving down the road, I, I put that hood ornament on the top of my car so everybody can see it. And I turn the Jesus music up real loud so people can hear it and stuff. It's, it's a life change and it's an ongoing life change. And a lot of times because What's happening is this is the 21st century. I mean, look, look at us, man. We got computers. I got cell phones. I got flat screen TV. I got so many things that are pulling me away from where I need to be is devoting my life and my time to Jesus Christ. So it's, it's tough. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and tell you it's easy. But can it be done? Yes, it can be done. And we do this through our relationships. Unless we know one another unless I sit down and talk to you and look you in the eye and we've had discussions and, and I've shared things with you. So that way, you know, me rather than the superficial me, because when you see me, all you see is just the house that I live in. In order for you to know who I am, you got to come inside the house, check out the wires, the plumbing, the, <laughs> the floor, see what's happening. And that way you'll get to know me and then we can share and we can grow together. But until that happens, man, you know, we're, we're just going to be sitting around, you know, trying to figure stuff out. But it's unfortunate, but we have to, you know, don't don't give up the fight. <laughs> keep keep praying. Hang in there. Amen to that. You, you're getting real deep now. And uh, I appreciate the the sincerity that that which is so necessary and to be genuine is is what we're absolutely called to do. So let's continue as we as we move forward through this. If I'm skipping over anybody who wants to say anything, give me a shout, say something, we will, we will slow down, we will back up. But this goes to what Gina was saying. Okay, so you have people who are doing this and unfortunately, those who, who advocate, who continue in these practices are, are false teachers. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter seven, verse 15, he says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. They look a certain way, but what they truly are is completely different. There is a huge difference between a sheep and a wolf. Now, wolf in sheep's clothing is part of our vernacular. We say it, we know what it means, but I want you to think about the damage that can actually be done if a wolf comes in with the rest of the sheep and is treated like sheep, when inwardly they are actually a wolf. The devastation that can be caused from within the flock will be catastrophic. Jesus says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. We know this, and I've talked about this, and many other people have talked about this. If I go to my orange tree and I pick lemons from an orange tree, what kind of tree do I actually have? I got a lemon tree. I say, no, 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 it's actually an orange tree. It just happens to grow lemons. You, you would laugh at me, that would be silly, right? You know a tree by its fruit. We name trees by the fruit. Apple trees have apples. You don't say, oh, this is a, this is a, a large trunk, you know, green leaf tree. Well, I don't care about that. Does it have apples? Oh yeah, it happens to have apples. Well then call it an apple tree because that's what's relevant. So if I call myself a Christian 
and I don't bear fruit in keeping with the spirit, I'm not a Christian. Now, that's heavy. We don't say that lightly because to tell someone, no, you're not a Christian, regardless of what you say you are, is offensive. We don't like to do that. We don't do it lightly. But Jesus is making it clear. You can judge a fruit. I'm sorry, you can judge a tree by its fruit. And you can judge a teaching about whether or not it comes from God. Jesus continues in verse 18. He says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down. Now this is scary. Cut down and thrown into the fire. Do not miss what he is saying there. Trees that do not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire in case you have your ears closed or you don't want to believe it or you are confused at all. He is talking about eternal damnation in hell. And that is terrifying. It should terrify you. These are the words of Jesus. There is a standard that is being set, a false teaching. If And this, this is one of the things, I, I, will, I will remind you of this. Whenever I am teaching or preaching, if you hear me say something that's not right, please correct me. Please say, well, hold up, stop. What you're saying is really this. And for years, selfishly, I would teach adults. I would teach people who knew the Bible better than I would. And it would, like, you couldn't mess it up. You couldn't, you couldn't say anything wrong because you would have literally 200 years of, of Christian experience in the room that would say, you know what, brother, I think you meant this and this, or no, hold up, what are you, what are you talking about? So it was such a blessing for me, and I was selfish, and so I would keep teaching, you know, all of these adult classes, and it was just something where I would learn more than I put in. Now, of course, it's important to make sure that you know what you're talking about before you just start talking, but knowing the word of God and obeying the word of God are two different things. Jesus was often arguing with the Pharisees. No one knew the Bible better than the Pharisees, but they didn't know God at all, even when he's standing right there. So we got yeah. some big, heavy issues that are going on. False teaching is, is completely wrong, completely evil, and it's unacceptable to God. It's, it's not a minor thing. Any thoughts? Anthony. Yeah, bro. <clears throat> Back um, in the, I guess it'd be the mid eighties, I had just become a Christian and there were three disfellowships that had happened in the church. Um, two of them were sexual immorality, but there was another one that was um, kind of unusual to me. Now, all of these occurred, the first one may have even occurred prior to me being baptized. If not, it was within a very short time of me being baptized. So I knew none of this. Coming out of the Lutheran church, there are no um, disfellowships. <laughs> and um, so a lot of things were new to me. And um, I kind of understood the weight of my own personal decision on things. Um, and I was okay with that. Um, we did something called counting the costs back then that before they ever even allowed me to be baptized, I had to go through a lot of decision making. Right. Uh, but uh, <laughs> this one, the first brother that I recall this happening to, he was married for uh, apparently a long time because he had children that were in their teens, I think at the time. Um, and <laughs> he was disfellowshipped um, to our knowledge or the, the information was brought to our knowledge after he had already been counseled for a long time by the men who were acting in a leadership position. And <laughs> Uh, sadly, we did not have elders then. Um, we just had men who were 
doing their best to try to run the church at the time. And um, so this guy was arrested as a male prostitute. And they apparently at that time had to then tell the church the reason we're disfellowshipping him was this long history of being a male prostitute as a married man with children in it. And I, I mean, my jaw was on the floor. I, at first, I really didn't even realize there were male prostitutes for the most part, and that that could happen in the city of Tampa, and that this was somebody who we knew, and this was somebody who was a Christian for a long time in the church type of a thing. I mean, I, I was just flabbergasted. Um, so that one made sense to me. And one, <laughs> by the time I kind of, kind of wrapped my mind around it, I'm like, well, okay, yeah, you know, seems to not be going away. Um, and so that another one, um, a very close friend of mine at the time, uh, she was this fellowship for adultery and unrepentant re adultery. She wasn't willing to give it up at that time. She did eventually, and she did come back to the church. They I don't even know what you call that refellowship them <laughs> um yeah i guess i don't know either re reinstate i don't know what what you call that but that it worked out at that time um for the better um and that's where i actually saw the practice um come full circle if you will from what paul was talking about in first corinthians the other one was really bizarre and again this was something where where people had been counseling this person for a long time but the person was um, consistently spending money that they didn't have falsely to go buy a bunch of things that they didn't have the money for, getting into debt, trying to do weird things to get out of it. I mean, it, it was a really, really bizarre situation, but essentially it was unrepentant sin that they were being counseled for that just wouldn't stop. And then that would kind of surprise me because now we were out of the sexual thing where it's nice and clear in scripture or whatever. And I mean, it, this was like, no, we've been telling this person over and over again, you can't do that. You're putting a bad black eye on the, on yourself, on the church, on, on everybody that's involved in doing this. Um, this is the wrong thing. Are you willing to change? And they weren't. And so they disfellowshipped him. And Arguably, that may have been one of the very last times I've seen someone disfellowshipped, and that was probably mid to late 80s. Mm. So thank you for sharing that. I've, I've witnessed a few people get disfellowshipped as well. It's not pleasant. It, it's not fun to be uh, in attendance to, to know people. And a lot of times it does seem to be over something sexual. But as you pointed out already, Keith, I've seen this done over someone who was embezzling funds. And as the Bible said, they were greedy. They were a swindler. And because of the unrepentant sin, which had nothing to do with sexuality or sexual immorality, they were disfellowshipped. And in every case that I've seen someone disfellowship, they all came back. They were all restored in Christ. When God's model was followed, I saw people come back to him. Now, people will come back sometimes and you don't get to see it. I don't know everything. You know, people can go to someplace else, get their life right, and things can be excellent. You know, they can be just as right with God as anybody else. But I got a chance to see it. So I can tell you I know God's plans work. I know his procedures I've seen them work the way they're supposed to. Now on the flip side of that, I've seen this not done. I've seen this not done more times than I've seen it actually done to where leaders know full well that someone is sinning, that someone has chosen a lifestyle. There is no struggle. There is a full embrace. This is who I am. This is what I do. I'm not apologizing for it. Deal with it people who will set their feet and clench their jaw and say, no, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. No consequences, no repercussions, no acknowledgement and say, you know what, what you've done is against the blood of Christ and we can no longer consider you a brother or sister in our fellowship. 
I haven't seen it done and I haven't seen them come back, not once. So I've seen a 100% success rate over here and a 100% failure rate over here. And one way is God's way and the other way is, is our way. Is it only, is there any wonder that God's way is going to work? Here, here's one of the things, I'm gonna say this, this is it, it's a little bit preachy. But you know, I'm not sorry, right? This is a little bit preachy. It's so important for us to acknowledge the reality that we don't know more than God. We don't know how to do this better than God knows how to do it. So when God says, do this, we say, ooh, that seems harsh. Mm, I think I got a better idea. No, you don't. You don't have a better idea. When you say, well, that doesn't seem very loving. I want to do this thing over here that's different than what God says because I'm loving. Do you really think you love this person more than God? Like how arrogant and foolish is that? For you to believe that you know better or you love someone more than God loves them is just ridiculous, but yet we do it all the time. No, that would hurt their feelings. That's harsh. You know, that, that's not loving. It's absolutely loving because it's what God said to do. And he is love. God is love. He is not loving. He is love. He defines love, not you. So doing things the right way recognizing what's false teaching and what's not and saying, you know what? The word of God is a sword. It divides the joint from the marrow, the soul from the spirit. And the word of God has cut nice and clean right here. You don't have to wonder. This person is caught up in, in embezzling money. They are a, an active thief. They will thief again. This person is caught up in this lifestyle over here that is completely contrary to what God has called them to do. Then you and I have a responsibility to obey. And if you are, man, how am I going to say it? There's a lot of irony that's going on this morning, right here, right now. There's a lot of irony. And um, perhaps we will discuss more of that later, but to not do things God's way, there needs to be something drastic in response because sin is drastic. Drastic measures must be taken. And we as members of the body have to be 100% obedient. And um, I've seen God's way work many, many times and I've seen our way fail many, many times. So false teaching, there is yeast that gets in and it and affects the whole church. It affects the whole church. I was part of a youth group and that youth group had some issues. I was part of a campus ministry and that campus ministry had some issues. And when the issues were dealt with the way that God said to deal with it, everyone took notice and things went better. When it didn't, everyone took notice and things went worse every single time. I've been a Christian a long time. And like Keith said, I haven't seen this actually get done correctly in at least 20 years. And that's like 2000. So we might go back even further. So maybe the 90s was the last time I saw someone get this fellowship and they came back maybe a few years later and it was a blessing to witness. But it's not a fun thing. It's, it's not enjoyable. And you, you do it with a very heavy heart every single time. But we trust God. And we teach the word, nothing, nothing but the word. Gina, we've been talking about your, your question, your concern regarding false teaching and, and how some people have embraced this. When that takes place, it's wrong. It's evil. It is contrary to what God has called us to do. We've looked at a few verses. Do these verses sort of answer and satisfy some of the concerns that you wanted to address. Yes, they do. And it also kind of reminded me about in first John chapter five, when John is talking about the false teachers and he tells the church, I'm not saying you should pray for these people because at the end of the day, this is the ones, this is one of the sins that will lead other people away from God inevitably. Like, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. It's not like you see and you're like, eh. It's like, no, if someone's teaching the wrong things, you're going to draw people away from God. So true. 
false teaching is is never embraced. It is it's scary, man. I don't ever want to be guilty of, of false teaching because I fear God and what will happen. You say, oh, you're not supposed to fear God. Perfect love casts out fear. My love ain't perfect then because that terrifies me. I've told you guys many times I've bolted away in the middle of the night thinking I got something wrong. And in this particular case, it was in the book of Acts and it talked about the house of Judas on Straight Street. And I remember being dead asleep and I popped awake. I'm like, wait, the house wasn't on Straight Street. And I frantically turned through, through my Bible and I looked, I'm like, wait, wait, it was, it was on Straight Street. And, and I could go back to sleep and everything was fine because this, this is a big deal. Those who teach will be judged more harshly according to the Bible. <laughs> That's a big deal. All right, babe, what do you, what do you got? Deanna on Facebook asks, where is the balance between doing a disfellowship with love and not turning people away or off? Ah, a great question, Deanna. Where is the balance of disfellowship and treating people with love, not turning them off? Um, so I will go back to what Daryl was saying. You get to know somebody. You get involved in their life. You don't sit around like, okay, are you doing wrong, doing wrong? Yes, bang, bye. You are disfellowship. No, there must be an active engagement in somebody's life because a lot of times you don't even know they may be struggling. You don't even know what their situation is. Someone may be fighting tooth and nail in addiction. And I've seen that happen. Somebody is addicted to drugs. And man, if you've ever known someone who's addicted to drugs or alcohol, it's miserable. It's miserable for them. And it's miserable for everyone that's even close to that person. It is miserable. So if someone is struggling and they're fighting, they're trying to do things this way and they're trying to do things that way. And you are working with them. You are saying, you know what? I'm shoulder to shoulder with you. I'm fighting for you. There's some brothers that are hopefully listening right now that we are shoulder to shoulder in this battle and they're going through some rough stuff. And when I've been going through some rough stuff, we get in and we fight. You got to understand what's happening in somebody's life. There comes a point when you say, look, here's what God has called you to do and you're not even trying to do it anymore. Why? What, what, what's happening there? So if you don't know somebody's life, you can't have that balance. If you don't know the word, you can't have that balance. So to speak the truth in love, Diana, is the first start of this. And, and let's be real. Sister, you, you, got, you got mistreated by some people who should not have mistreated you. Can I, can I be real? You got mistreated and you know some people who got mistreated that should not have treated you or treated people that you know and you care about the way that they did. And that was wrong, flat out wrong of the devil, sinful. And they're going to have to stand before God and give an answer for that. So um, I, I don't want to, you know, be like, hey, let me let me get in, get in, you know, this person's business, that person's business. But there's people on this call right now who have seen this done wrong seen this not done right because love was never in it. That's what was wrong. You can't get a balance of truth and love if there's no love. And the love was never there. And obedience to the word was never there. So there was no balance. Speaking the truth in love. God says this, God loves you, he wants you. And we can do everything we can to make sure that you get closer to God. That's how you get some balance. But when, there's, when it's not there, no balance. Yeah, babe. I think a couple other things that are really important in addition to everything you just said <clears throat> is um, one, checking our own biases mm. and our own comfortability levels um, because that clouds it. Like, well, this thing isn't that bad. I can tolerate that more or I'm really uncomfortable with this so I'm going to hit this person over the head even harder. Um, and then the second thing, <clears throat> excuse me, that I've seen um, done is as just people we have our own timetables sometime and we kind of expect people to get themselves together when we want them to. And I don't see that with Jesus. Um, his own <laughs> disciples were with him for three years and still didn't get stuff. He didn't throw them off and say, well, you should have got this then. He was like frustrated at times. He was patient with them and loving, but he never gave up on them and never cast them away. He washed Judas's feet. He loved him knowing what he was going to do, but he still loved him. And I think we, <clears throat> we get in our own minds like, well, 
I've said everything great. I love them. I've done all these things and they're still not getting it together. So clearly they're wrong. And being someone who took a long time to, to get it for myself. And even once I got it, I guess you still don't fully understand everything because God is inexhaustible. But um, there were times when I was like, if anybody had come at me for the things that I was doing um, and they didn't do it in a loving way or they try to humiliate me or you know, just make me feel worse, I wouldn't be a Christian to this day. <clears throat> or someone else would have led me to Christ and they wouldn't be able to be a part of my story um, because everyone's journey is their own journey and you won't have a voice, you won't have a platform, you won't have the privilege to walk alongside anybody that you don't love, you aren't patient with, and you judge um, because that's something that you are not okay with. That's so true. And um, everything you said was, was 100% accurate. By the way, if everybody here, Nicole? Everybody here, my wife? Yes, all right, I'm getting some thumbs up, a couple thumbs up, excellent. So I'm glad you guys could hear her say that in her own words because my wife has been on the front lines of dealing with a lot of this. Life is not, it's not clean, it gets messy. And when we interact with people, loved ones, friends, family members, things don't always move in a straight line. They're not, oh yeah, you, you got this, you understand it at this rate. Everyone moves at a different rate. But those who are seeking God, it's important for us to draw them in. I, I got a couple of verses I'm thinking of uh, where it says a bruise a reed. You know the verse I'm talking about, bruise reed, he will not break. I'm cheating, I'm typing into my word search. And by that I mean it's, it's not really cheating. Uh, Isaiah 42, verse 3. Get a little Old Testament for you. The Bible says, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. So those who are weak and failing and struggling, he does not say, you know what, forget it. You, you disgust me. As a loving parent, think about how patient you are with them trying to walk with your children getting potty trained, when they actually go potty where they're supposed to, you clap, you are excited about that. When that toddler starts to get up and take a couple steps and they fall, you are ecstatic. You don't go, two steps, is it all you got? You're worthless, you disgust me. You call yourself a baby? You're the worst ever, get out of my house. You don't do that unless you're an absolute maniac, unless you're insane. That's crazy. God doesn't do that to you spiritually, but you know who does? We do. The Pharisees were super duper guilty of this. The Bible says they stood in the door and kept people out. And unfortunately, that's what happens among people who've been Christians a long time. Wait a minute. You know what, man? I've been walking so long, you know, and this, this baby over here, look, I was walking at nine months, okay? Like nine months. What is this, 12, 12 months? And you're still not walking? I don't think you're ever going to get this. And we do that sometimes. I've been guilty of doing stuff like that. And it's evil, man. And that, that scares me. I've repented. I'm, I keep on repenting. And that, that, that's scary to not do uh, to not show love, to not do things God's way. And let me throw this in here before we end. In so many instances in the Bible where you see someone just flip out and lose their mind and come down super hard on somebody that's sinning, in almost every case, that person is also caught up in a sin. And they've been living a lie and they're entangled in a mess. And some of the most notable examples are King David. When the prophet Nathan came to King David after David had essentially raped Bathsheba and murdered Uriah, the prophet Nathan tells him a story about a dude who stole a sheep, a rich guy who stole a sheep when he had a bunch of sheep, he stole a pet sheep, killed the sheep and served it to a guest. David was so enraged, he says, bring me the man, I will kill him right here. 
Now, the penalty for stealing somebody's sheep was not death. That is not justice in the Jewish system. So David was way out of line. But David was way out of line because he had raped and murdered. He was guilty. And so his reaction to sin was to overdo it. But it was partly because of his own guilt. Now, I've had people absolutely hammer me over minor infractions. I used to be notorious for showing up to stuff late. I'm not quite as notorious, but I used to be really, really bad. Walk in 15 minutes late, like what? I'm here. Just be thankful I arrived. And that used to burn up at least one brother in Christ. Now, I'm not going to put him on blast because he's repented. But this brother was caught up in adultery. And he had been engaged in adultery for years. And so he is hammering me for being late while he is actively cheating on his wife. I submit to you, when you see people who are not doing things God's way, there's a lot more to it than what they want to let on. So look for that. When you see somebody's like, well, you're doing this and you should be doing that. Well, wait a minute. You've gone beyond what the Bible says. The Pharisees were a great example. Jesus, you healed on the Sabbath. How dare you? Um, there's no law against healing on the Sabbath, guys. They're actively trying to murder him. And eventually they were successful. So they're upset that he's performing a miracle on the Sabbath when they're actively trying to murder him. So I want you to keep that in mind. This is not of God. When we've done this wrong, it was of the devil. The devil is the one who was winning in those situations. It happened way back then, and it happens now. It happens among religious people. It happens among people who are in leadership, people who have authority. And when you see them abuse that authority, even if it's derived from Christ, even if it's derived from God, because God set David up as king. So his authority was godly. He abused it. And when you see that abuse of what God has given, it often results in being unmerciful, not being loving. So you can't have any balance if there's no love, if you're not being obedient. And that's what you see. That's what many of us have already seen, unfortunately. Deanna. Say it nice and loud. Huh? Deanna writes, thank you. I appreciate that. Deciphering between when it's coming from a place of love and when it isn't can be difficult when it's coming from those who are supposed to be those who are, I'm sorry, those who are supposed to lead you to God. I know it's maybe another topic, but I'm curious about the guidance behind the healing process from this kind of hurt. It definitely leaves a scar. Mm. All right. So it sounds like next week we need to pick up on what do you do when someone returns? I want you to be thinking prodigal son. I want you to be thinking of how the father embraced the son and celebrated. I want you to be thinking about what the Bible says regarding when a non-believer decides to get baptized and how there's angels that are rejoicing in heaven. Those are gonna be some of the things that we will most likely pick up with next week because there should be an embrace, there should be celebration. I want you to also be thinking about when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and Jesus says, take the grave clothes off of him and let him go. Spoiler alert, when somebody repents, take the grave clothes off and let them go. Don't hold them to the deeds that were done that they've repented of. They're free. They're forgiven. Let them go. Let them be free. Not like let them go as in by, like let them go as let them be in peace. Let, like come, let them go. Let them come on in. Celebrate. Embrace them because that which was lost has now been found. But that's, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. All right. It's almost 10 o'clock. So I'm going to, I'm going to say thank you guys for being here. There was a lot of good information. And I think that we got a lot to talk about again next week. But Gina, are we, have we satisfied the question that you originally asked? Yes. All right. Thank you so much for asking that. As you can see, there was a lot of uh, discussion that needed to happen as a result of this. So what God puts on your heart, your mind is obviously going to be shared among the hearts and minds of other believers because the Holy Spirit is here and he is moving 
among us. Thank you guys so much for being uh, in attendance this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Anthony. You guys have a good one. Love all Love of you. All right, take care.